Hi, my name is Steve Weber. It's April 6th, 2018. I'm here to interview Fernando Corbido, everyone knows him as Corby, for the ACM Turing Award winner of 1990 for his contributions to computer science. So Corby, what, what, tell me about your early life, uh, where you went to school, where you're born, your family, your parents, anything that's interesting for the history of computer science? Well, my parents uh, met at the uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, and uh, they, uh, my father got, got his doctorate in, in uh, Spanish literature, and uh, he, uh, I was born in Oakland, California, and Proceeded to uh, we we might we he got his first position at UCLA, which was then a, a new campus in Los Angeles, uh, and as a professor of Spanish literature, and uh, so I, of course, wasn't very conscious of much in those day, at the, at, the, at those ages, but. Uh, I basically grew up in West Los Angeles and uh, went to public high schools, uh, first grammar school, then junior high, and then I began uh, high school. Uh, what were your favorite subjects in high school? Uh, I tended to enjoy uh, the mathematics type of subjects. Uh, as I recall, algebra was was easy and uh, enjoyable, uh, and the uh, one of the results of that was that uh, uh, I was in high school at the time of when World War II, be when the when Pearl Harbor occurred. And uh, MIT was, or rather, uh, the, the United States was was drawn in, drawn into to the war. Uh, the, uh, as I recall, uh, Pearl Harbor occurred. Uh, I think it was on a Sunday. Uh, but one of the results was that it uh, shocked the U.S. into reacting to the, the war uh, effort. And uh, one of the results was that uh, the, uh, everything went into kind of a wartime footing. And well, I, I uh, one of the things that happened was that the, the high school which I was, was at began to offer, uh, an, uh, as I recall, an A and, and a Z period. Uh, where the A was early, uh, early session, and the Z period was a late session. Uh, to accommodate students who were going to work in, in local industry and uh, essentially pursue, aid the uh, war effort. Did you uh, do any of that yourself? Uh, I took advantage and uh, sped up my, my program and proceeded to graduate from high school in two years rather than the usual three. Uh, I, I think I had to go to uh, a couple s summer school classes to squeeze it in, uh, to finish it up. So uh, basically, uh, as I recall, I took solid straight, uh, solid geometry and trigonometry as my two summer school courses. Uh, in any case, I graduated from high school in, in basically two years rather than three. Um, 
What other things did you do in high school besides study all the time? <laughs> well, I was, uh, I don't recall anything Part particularly. Uh, I wasn't, I, I wasn't an ass, in, <coughs> I wasn't into athletics, uh, for, uh, but I, uh, I took advantage to start UCLA uh, in, uh, in, the, in that, that following fall. And uh, one of the consequences was that uh, I, was, I was going to major in physics. Uh, although it was, I don't recall, it wasn't very specialized at that, at that early stage. Uh, one of the next pivotal events was uh, some Navy recruiter uh, came by and uh, outlined being able to join the, the so-called Eddy program, which was a, a 12 months program that the Navy was organizing to uh, allow students to train train st students to be technicians to service uh, all of the fancy uh, equipment that was being deployed in the in the in the Navy. Um, it was it was it was called the Eddy program, uh, and so. After seven, seven months of the first year at UCLA, uh, I decided that that was an important step for me to take. Uh, it, it meant I would uh, be able to join the Navy rather than be drafted into the Army. And uh, that seemed preferable uh, at the time. So I, I, I did join the, the Eddy program uh, after, and uh, proceeded to uh, start in this 12-month program. What kind of stuff did they do in the Eddy program? What kind of a well, it was a it was a very carefully it was named after a Captain Eddy who th th thought up the whole idea, uh, and uh, it, the basic idea was was to train. Uh, a cadre of of uh, of, tech, of technicians who could service and maintain the uh, very uh, the very fa fancy uh, electronic equipment that was being deployed to the to the fleet. Uh, things like uh, radar, Loran. Uh, uh, I've lost track of the litany at the moment, but uh, it seemed like a great opportunity to get an education uh, and stall off and also pick my service so I wouldn't have to go, go in the Army and be a, essentially some sort of a foot, sho foot, sho foot shoulder soldier. Um, so how long did you stay in the Navy then? Um, well, the Eddy program itself uh, consisted of, of about 12 months of, of training. Uh, the first two weeks, I think, were up at uh, Great Lakes Training Center, and uh, where you basically got used to being in, wearing a uniform and being in the Navy. Uh, and, and then the next month was so-called pre-radio, were down in uh, in uh, outside of Chicago, and where I basically got uh, it was basically a review of of algebra and and uh, very early mathematics, uh, and then it was followed by six months of training at the uh, Del, Del Monte Hotel, which was 
had been commandeered by the Navy, which was in Carmel, California. And uh, the, uh, that was a, a very famous resort hotel. Uh, and we, I spent three months there and uh, learning, uh, basically reviewing elementary uh, mathematics and, and, and very straightforward uh, things. And then followed by six months up at uh, Treasure Island, which was uh, an artificial island that had been built off of the uh, Yerba Buena Island in the, at, at the middle of the San Francisco Bay. And the six months at, at, uh, at Yerba Buena Island were spent uh, learning, reviewing the, the detailed circuits and, and logic of, of, all, of the various pieces of equipment that we were probably going to have to service uh, when we got out deployed into the field. And after the six months at Yerba Buena, uh, I was assigned to a, a pre-commissioning crew of a destroyer tender, which was being built up in uh, Tacoma, Washington, and uh, we were we were the so-called pre-commissioning crew, and we so I remember we had to, to uh, load all the supplies on the ship, and and uh, the, the ship was being fi being finished as we basically uh, graduated. As, as I. Uh, I've lost track of that thought, train of thought. Um, so, so after the Navy, then you went back to UCLA? Uh, no, I, I came after the Navy. I got out in somewhere I'm about uh, May of 19, uh, 1946. And by then, uh, I had the opportunity to use the GI Bill. Uh, which allowed me to uh, go to Caltech, uh, which it seemed like a, uh, a good, an expensive but good choice. And but the GI Bill was covering uh, my college tuition, and uh, so I I started UCL. I started Caltech, and. Uh, I expected to be, a, I, I believe I was majoring in physics and, uh, and had a, a, a nice, pleasant uh, four-year time at Caltech until I finally graduated in 1950. Um, my next step was to uh, I applied to graduate schools and uh, in, in physics. And I, I remember being admitted to MIT. And uh, so that sounded like uh, a good opportunity. And I proceeded to, uh, in, the, in the summer of 1946, I, I proceeded to to uh, load up my car, uh, jam-packed, and uh, proceed with all my stuff, and proceed to drive cross-country uh, by myself. So that was in 1950, after uh, graduating from Caltech? That would be 1950, after I graduated from Caltech. Yes, correct. Um, in retrospect, I'm somewhat unnerved by my daring, daring approach because I uh, 
my car wasn't that. Uh, it, was, it was a used car, and it wasn't that overly reliable. And, uh, and uh, I had to, uh, I actually, I remember sle sleeping on the road. I would just pull off to the edge of the road and l lay down a sleeping bag and, and, and go to sleep. And I drove cross country by myself without in what I would consider now a, a, ver a very hazardous trip. <laughs> That's interesting. I did the same thing going out to my graduate school. And it took me three days to drive across the country all alone, sleeping in the car when I could. Same thing. So when, <laughs> when you got to MIT, uh, what did you do that summer before entering MIT? Did I do what? What did you do in the summer after you arrived in Cambridge, I assume, or somewhere around there? Well, before it was, actually the end, it was the school? end of the summer. Oh, it was the end of the summer, okay. That I arrived. And so I, uh, I uh, had a, uh, don't know how I, how I got arranged. But I had a, a uh, uh, I was assigned to a dorm room in the, in the graduate house and uh, proceeded to uh, share a dorm room with uh, the late Henry Kendall, uh, who died, died in the scuba driving uh, that years later, and Dan Willard. Uh, and we roomed together for uh, basically the, the, f the first year. Uh, and then I proceeded to, uh, I was persuaded by a fellow graduate student, John Little, uh, to uh, uh, join him and share, <coughs> <coughs> join him in sh sharing an apartment uh, in Beacon, on Be Beacon Hill, and so I decided I I would do that, and uh, I proceeded to uh, spend uh, several uh, several years uh, in my apartment uh, in in the apartment on Be Beacon Hill. What were you studying at MIT? Was it real physics, or had there been any computer stuff yet? Um, no, there was, there was no, <coughs> there was no, uh, there was no particular uh, computer courses at that time. Uh, computers were still uh, something that was evolving. Uh, but I did, I did come under the wing of, of uh, Philip Morris. And he proceeded to uh, get me a, a a a fellowship in using uh, on using computers. What was Philip Morse's job? Was he the head of? Philip Morse was a. Uh, I think he was the executive officer of the physics department. Okay. Uh, but he was a he was a a, 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 a very well known uh, figure in in physics, uh, and he was a bit entrepreneurial, and he proceeded to uh, cadger out of. Of, out of the uh, uh, O and R, a series of of uh, O and R, the Office of Naval Research. O and R being the Office of Naval Research, um, or what does O and R stand for? I think it was Office of Naval Research. Okay, but he got this uh, set of fellowships, which. Uh, and I had one of those. And one of the things I, I re remember best is that uh, we got, 
we were allowed to do programming uh, on uh, the Whirlwind computer. And the Whirlwind computer was, was built as a prototype of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the SAGE system for computers. Um, it was what, what made it Whirlwind rather unique is that it was a 24-bit uh, parallel computer, that is, uh, whereas many of the c computers in the early days uh, from f had been s serial computers, which meant that uh, they were considerably slower. But the, uh, the, the goal of the uh, Whirlwind computer was in tr trying to uh, uh, basically create a system which could do real-time real -time computation for uh, air defense. It eventually led to the MITRE system. Later. So, so when you were getting into programming the whirlwind, what did that consist of? What kind of programming was that? Well, it was uh, programming consisted of uh, of creating a punch paper tape, which would be read flex, so called flexo writer tapes, which would be read into the computer by a, a, a fast reader, and uh, and then proceed to. Uh, execute on the computer. Uh, the, uh, the main thing that occurred was that uh, because the computer was being used to develop uh, the uh, air defense system that eventually became MITRE, uh, the, the, we, uh, we we, the people that were able to use Whirlwind uh, at that time, we weren't uh, under any security blanket or, or uh, and so we had to use it on the, on the, on the night shift, basically from, uh, from, from 12 to, uh, from midnight to, uh, to morning. Were you actually programming the eventual uh, real software that was going to be used, or were you just practicing and programming for the fun of it? We were doing the real software, oh. of, 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 uh, not for the air defense system. Uh, that was all under wraps. And right. Okay. We were not. We weren't even supposed to know about it. <laughs> but uh, we, we were allowed to use this, the scraps, basically. Uh, of the middle of the night. So that meant uh, I got used to working crazy hours. Uh, uh, and um, s sleeping late at night, sleeping late, sleeping in the morning, and uh, getting, getting up, getting up later in, in the day and, and uh, in order to st start my Midnight shift there. Uh, so after Whirlwind, uh, what was the next computer-related thing you did? I mean, how long did you do Whirlwind? When did, what, what time was that? Uh, I did that th through my graduate work. Uh, and uh, I proceeded to uh, do some computations on uh, molecular orbit. So-called so molecular orbitals. Um, it was it was really kind of dull, <laughs> but um, in any case, by the end of '56, uh, I uh, I had gotten my uh, graduate. My, my doctorate, and uh, 
I proceeded to uh, the next thing that happened was that Morse in his entrepreneurial self had uh, convinced IBM to uh, establish a uh, what was then a uh, a major computer called the IBM 704 uh, at uh, at the computation center, which was, uh, in fact, he got this, he, he came in late in the game, and uh, he got this, this, this IBM computer, his deal was that MIT would, would run this computer, uh, MIT would build a computer room and would operate it for the benefit of itself and some roughly 40 uh, New England colleges uh, who would have time on the computer. Um, and the result was that uh, my recollection is that Morse had enough clout that he got MIT to uh, essentially build it on the ground floor of a new building, Building 26, uh, which was in the st in the style of the day was built on stilts, and so Morse persuaded MIT that. Uh, they had to put in the ground floor, covering up the stilts, and the architects were, of course, incensed. Uh, so they re retaliated by making the ground floor uh, have no windows <laughs> and had only transoms, a, f a few transoms, and making it all in blue tile to make it sort of look like it wasn't there. Um, so that was the MIT's first computer center. Computer science was is, is basically a 704. Uh, as it, the computers evolved, they kept they kept MIT and indeed in those days, of course, computers were all batch processed, and uh, so MIT basically ran the computer, and uh, people would. Uh, at best come down from the New England colleges and s submit jobs and, uh, and then go back. But uh, it was not a, not a great arrangement for the New England colleges. Um, and there were other, other things that happened where uh, nobody had counted uh, one shift was supposed to be for MIT. One shift was supposed to be for the use of the New England colleges. But there was a fourth shift, basically the weekend, but n which no one had remembered to count in. <laughs> so that was, so we, we scraped up all the, the, uh, the crumbs and had a lot, of, a lot of computer time. But Who is we? Um, Basically, we was the uh, we operated uh, the seven oh seven oh four for the benefit of, of of the MIT personnel and around the campus uh, who had to to learn to to program had to learn to I guess they did. People did their own key punching, and uh, basically it was all very primitive and by today's standards. Uh, pretty awkward for the people at the New England colleges. So some of them would come down and stay for a day or two and, and go back. Uh, one person, one such person was John McCarthy, who uh, was uh, sufficiently interested in 
trying to use the computer that he, he proposed the notion of time sharing. And uh, that seemed like a, a, a very, very uh, useful idea. When was this that he came up with this concept of time sharing? Um, I believe he proposed it in a symposium that was run in 1962. Yeah, 1962, I think. Uh, and, and was he at MIT then, or was he at another school? Um, he came, he decided that it was important enough for him, to, he, he moved from Dartmouth to, to MIT. And uh, so he, he proceeded to, uh, uh, yeah, and I shared, I shared an office with him for a while, um, but. That's interesting. We, we'll get to it in a bit about CTSS, but Dartmouth had their own time sharing system called DTSS about the same time. And uh, was he involved in that, do you know? What happened was that um, there was a proposed, I guess it was proposed to NSF that uh, we build a, a, a time sharing system. And the person that was designated to, to lead that was Professor Herb Teeger. Uh, Teeger was, I believe, a professor of electrical engineering. Uh, and uh, so Tigger started working on the, but Tigger had a, a somewhat difficult personality. He he, uh, he tended to rebuff. Uh, he tended to be a loner. He liked to work alone. He didn't work with other people very easily, and uh, so Tigger proceeded to. Uh, play his cards close to his vest, and he had started imagining what a kind of a time sharing system he would build. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the more I heard of it, the more grandiose it seemed. He was going to have language translation and uh, all kinds of elaborate ideas that uh, were way beyond the state of the art. and. Uh, so, and it was about that time that McCarthy got fed up uh, at, at MIT's lack of lack of attention to his vision of what should happen. So at that point, I think McCarthy went out to Stanford. Uh, and uh, so things were kind of in the lurch. And uh, so one day I, I came up with the notion of, of trying to, to build a, uh, a very simple-minded time sharing system, uh, which we could sneak in and run with the uh, with, with the st standard computing system uh, with a few caveats, namely that uh, it had to be, it had to have a smaller amount of memory. Uh, I had to set, had to set aside 5,000 words for the supervisor program. This was on a 7090? Uh, and, and I think it was probably a... 94? No, not yet. Uh, it was a 704, either a 4 or... I think it was a 704, maybe a 709. Okay. 
How much memory did that have of the 5,000? How Just much more was it? Just a bank of 32K. 32K, okay. Uh, and these uh, are 36-bit words? 36-bit words. Uh, so uh, in order to, to be, I came up with this plan to, to build a time series system where we snuck out uh, 5,000 words for a, uh, a supervisor program. Uh, which would then become, uh, and we would, and the, the remainder of the, of the memory was for uh, having a little trouble retracing. For, for the stuff. user image while it was running or something? Uh, what, what type of hardware additions were required to make it work? I, I know we needed interrupts and stuff. Very good question. Uh, one thing that was required was a, a uh, basically a, a relocation register, uh, which would uh, allow one to uh, basically uh, to modify the address that programs could run in, so that you could run programs uh, that were uh, not not at all at the the beginning of memory. Uh, a second thing that was re uh, required with some sort of a uh, a real-time clock uh, so that you could uh, run programs and interrupt them after a certain amount of time. And uh, the the key the key result was, and I forget the chronology here a little bit, uh, but we managed to get a, uh, another bank of, of, of 32K memory. Uh, so that, that allowed us to uh, basically have 32K for the supervisor and then 32K for a user? Um, Something like that? Did IBM make hardware changes for you because you asked for it to make this work? Um, they did. <clears throat> they did for everything but the clock. I think we had to build a clock, or you know, we had one of our more clever engineer, clever people managed to hook that up. Uh, so in, in any case, we managed to. Uh, cobble together a system which could basically do sw sw swapping of programs. Uh, as I recall, the, the first swapping was uh, we would swap each user out to a magnetic tape. Uh, and so we could run swap in another and run it. And it was all very crude and, and primitive. but. Uh, we got the system up and running, uh, and I think it was that was the imp impetus to get a second bank of 32k, k words, uh, because we, we didn't have to swap people uh, mm -hmm. out of memory. Uh, so, so this sounds like the 7094. The CTSS was running on. Um, was this was this the system that eventually was CTSS? The one you're describing. Oh, um, we we eventually were able to get sufficient time sharing system going that uh, uh, Bob Fano uh, saw interactive programming as uh, a uh, clearly a way to go, and uh, he proceeded to propose Project Mac. And uh, we, in turn, had uh, see Project Mac uh, got was first proposed, I think Fano wrote the proposal in uh, in the, in the fall of 63, 
and then proceeded to. Uh, what was Bob Fano's role? Was he another professor? Was he? Well, Bob Fano was a professor in the electrical engineering department who had uh, done outstanding work, which I was not particularly familiar with, but in the information systems. Uh, but he was sufficiently, um, sufficiently intrigued by the notion of of interactive computing that he uh, wrote the fir first proposal for Project Mac and uh, it w was it was to be a uh, and he he chose to start it off by having a summer an invitational summer program for people all around the country to come uh, visit and sort of kick the tires uh, and see what time sharing was like using CTSS. Uh, and so uh, he proceeded to uh, start up Project Mac uh, initially on the, uh, I recall, the 11th floor or something. It was the tenth floor. No, 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 not tenth. Ninth floor. Um, uh, over at the. Uh, five forty-five Tech Square. Five forty-five Tech Square, uh, where we kind of lucked out. Where uh, uh, the uh, there was a uh, one of the. Service bureau companies had over ambitiously uh, leased out space on that building, and uh, they suddenly had hit hard times. And so basically, Fano was able to get two floors of, of that building over at 545 Tech Square uh, because of their bad luck. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I remember. I was on the fifth floor for years and years where your office was. Well, yeah, we, we gradually evolved and uh, took over more and more f floors of the building. Uh, uh, so getting back to CTSS, so in Project MAC, what does MAC stand for? I've um, heard a couple of acronyms that... Yeah, there was a lot of jokes about that. Um, I don't it was it was uh, one was Minsky against Corby. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, the. Uh, that would be Marvin Minsky, the. Marvin uh, linguist. The, the late Marvin Minsky. Right. Uh, uh, the one I choose to remember is Man in Computer, but man it was in computer. but it was also the first three letters of machine, and there was a lot of. A lot of right. Yeah. Um, so Project Mac started in '63, and by then the CTSS was already there. And uh, w what happened next? Um, well, we ran the summer study. Uh, of the uh, we invited a bunch of people to come visit. Uh, I didn't, of course, but uh, people like Dick Mills, who was Fano's associate director, and uh, and. It, we, of course, things were happening so fast, we didn't really have a computer. We only had the thing, the time, the time, the system over at the computation center. And uh, so we proceeded to uh, basically borrow, borrow the computer time on the com off the computation center, which was running normal batch processing. And uh, we proceeded to, uh, operated at a distance uh, using, uh, as I recall, the, the modems in those days were terribly clumsy and uh, yeah. big boxes. 110 baud, 
Uh, they're inc incredibly slow. Slow and the like. <coughs> right. But, uh, so, so when did you get your own computer? It didn't show up until about October of uh, the uh, 19, of that. 63? 60. Uh, and that was put on the ninth floor? And that was put on the uh, ninth floor. Yes, I think so. Yeah. The 10th floor was what, refrigeration or something? Yeah, I think the 9th floor. I remember going up to the 9th floor and actually putting magic numbers into the switches on that computer uh, wow. with Jerry Clancy. Jerry Clancy had written some of the supervisor for CTSS. Mm -hmm. And if the right pattern were in the switches, it gave Jerry Clancy privileges, all the privileges he needed. <laughs> so at one time, we needed to do something seriously upstairs doing the switches. There was no keyboard or anything. Anyway, so you got your, uh, your own computer uh, in the fall of 63, and you immediately, I assume, brought CTS up on it? Um, yeah, we, we've, well, it was actually October-ish. Yeah. Um, and uh, at that point, we could, uh, could run we could basically uh, leave, the, let the computation center uh, have its all of its machine back. Right. Uh, actually, we uh, we may have run it for a while more, but uh, in any case, the uh, the computer system. Uh, the one thing that was sort of noticeable about it was, in order to keep our sanity, we, the, the computer uh, Project Mac had uh, red, red panels, and uh, the computer at, back at the computation set had blue panels. So we used to refer to them as the red and the blue machines. Sounds a little political these days. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, go, go on. So. No, that's OK. So now we have a computer. Is it true that eventually the computer center machine ran CTSS all the time as well? I don't. I don't remember. Maybe. You know. I don't remember that it did. Uh, it had it had an extra bank of 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 of, of core memory. So. Possibly could have. So when you got your computer in '63, uh, did it have disks, or was it all mag tape? Or um, I think you might have been swapping out the disk by then. Yeah, we had begun. We had somehow managed to uh, start storing programs on on disk rather than one tape per user. Uh, that was, of course, extravagant. It was just as a, a demo. Uh, to use a tape for per user, but, but. Uh, and IBM was working with you on all of this, trying to yes. get, get all their stuff in uh, order. Good point. Uh, IBM was working with us. Uh, and one of the things that uh, we shortly began to, to, to plan was uh, It was decided that Project Mac should uh, plan, plan a new machine uh, meant explicitly for time sharing. Uh, and uh, IBM sort of thought they had us in our pocket, their, their pocket. Um, but in fact, and we went and visited a lot of manufacturers and the like. Uh, we. Uh, this was in probably '64. Um, I mean, the the fall joint computer papers about Maltics came out in '65, so I assume it was a year or two before that. It was. Let's see. Boy, it's hard to keep track of dates. Yeah, it's a long time ago. Yeah. Um, 
we, we, we went on a series of trips visiting different vendors to see if they were interested in building a machine more explicitly for time sharing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, I forget who was actually part of the, of the, of the group that visited the different vendors. Uh, certainly I was. Uh, the, uh, and we visited a CDC, we visited, uh, we ended up visiting uh, General Electric, uh, well. What about UNIVAC and Burroughs and all we, of those? We, so you we, went to we all of them? We hit all of the big, the big ones. Yeah. Uh, if, if they were interested in building a ship, a, a, a computer, explicitly for time sharing. Um, turns out that there was a, a rather daring and one might have say, uh, uh, G, G had a, uh, had a uh, computer division out in uh, Phoenix. Phoenix, yeah, and uh, we proceeded. They had a an engineer who basically was much too amenable to to change, and he basically promised to do anything we wanted. And uh, who who was that? John Clure. John Clure, JFC, and. Uh, he, he, what we didn't appreciate at that time was that uh, GE was a, a very large company, but it basically uh, was run with each, each division running its own shop and basically uh, uh, answering, t not, not answering it, it didn't have a, it wasn't as, as integrated as, as a company like IBM, mm -hmm. which had a, a single management. Uh, GE had multiple managements. And uh, so Kalur basically promised to do anything we wanted. And uh, it sounded pretty good uh, to our naive selves. And uh, so we elected to, uh, to, uh, to work with John Kalur to design what came to be the uh, the 645. Right, GE already had a 635 that yeah. was running GCOS batch processing all the time. Right. So he was going to modify that. He was going to modify it all to hell. Yeah. And, uh, one of the consequences of that was that IBM, who had sort of viewed us as being likely to pick an IBM machine, was secretly building, had basically not unveiled the fact that they had a different notion entirely of how to build computers, namely uh, building uh, a family of computers uh, all of which had the same architecture, which, which ran faster or slower, to, depending on how much you paid for it. Uh, and uh, so the result was that when they heard we had agreed to work with GE, IBM totally panicked and uh, proceeded to uh, well, I think that they, they did some t t terribly drastic things. They embarked on a time-sharing system of their own, uh, called, which was called the 60, 60s, Model 67, as I recall. Yes. And, uh, and it would run CPCMS eventually. 
which was a virtual machine to run timesharing users right. And they did a crash program of trying to assign a thousand programmers to work on it at once. And they, they came up terribly lame. Uh, right, Brooks's book, um, Mythical Man Month. What's that? Brooks's book, The Mythical Man Month, explained how IBM kept putting more and more people on it, which was slowing it down more and more because they got it, it, you don't throw people at it, you throw intelligence. And uh, so that didn't work at all. But what, one of the results was that um, one of the programmers who had uh, been with us initially had gone to work for IBM, Bob Creasy. And uh, he basically saved the bacon for them by implementing a, 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 a as, as I recall, a, a simple-minded time-sharing system, which you called the DMSs, I think for them. And basically, IBM has sold, sold people these, people that bought these computers basically on faith that IBM would provide them with an operating system, when in fact they had no such thing. Right. Yeah, I don't think VMS ever really made the light of day. The only thing that saved them at all was the CPCMS thing that ran on the 67. Anyway, um, so IBM was upset. So John Kalur and GE is now building you the 645. Um, when did that arrive? When did that what? Well, before, before that, in the fall of 65, you and several others wrote these great papers in the Fall Joint Computer Conference about something called Multix, your, your new next generation time sharing system. Um, what does Multix stand for? Multiplex Information Computing Service. And the key thing about that was it was going to be a service, just like the telephone dial tone. It's always there. And so uh, Multics was born with those papers, I believe. Um, t tell me how those papers came to be and how, how you had to get a team together to do all that work. Because there was a lot of design work before those papers were published. Well, f um, <coughs> I think it was Fano that insisted we, we write in advance what we wanted to do. And... Uh, so we wrote these papers, which were uh, a little grandiose and fanciful, as I recall. We did most of it. <laughs> and uh, we weren't uh, weren't we weren't able to uh, pull off. Um, all all of the things we. We were. So we were talking about the fall joint computer papers. Uh, who, who are some of the other authors of those papers besides you? Um, well, as I recall, uh, I think Fano and uh, Ed David wrote one, I think. Was, was Salzer involved in those, Jerry? S Salzer. Salzer? Um, he was involved about that time, I know. I know Stan Dutton wrote one on I.O. What's that again? Stan Dutton one run, wrote one on the I.O. system that Multics might have, and uh, with maybe Vizotsky or something. I've lost track of it. Yeah. Anyway, so those papers kind of laid the groundwork for what became Multics. Uh, what happened next? Did you start hiring people to do this big work? I know the hardware wasn't there yet. Yeah, the, uh, I guess we started hiring people. I, I've lost track of exactly the chronology of, of everything occurring, but we clearly had, uh, we clearly developed a staff of, of all on the fifth floor there. 
Right. And uh, I remember I was hired in about seven months later, and so, and there were people already there by the time I got there. Uh, how, how big did the group get on the fifth floor that was doing this work? Well, we had two or three people per office, and it was basically we had uh, one half of the fifth floor. Uh, so uh, I've lost track of the head count. Right. Uh, it was probably in the order of 30 or so. I know that the IBM effort had a thousand or something. You know, they had way too many people trying to do it. And yeah. uh, that was part of their problem. IBM went at it all wrong. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, uh, Bob Creasy saved their bacon by yeah. implementing VM, which is a, a very simple-minded uh, swapping system, which because they, IBM had already sold sold the hardware to people and c customers all over the place as its equipment's sitting idle, uh, not doing what it was supposed to do. All right. So the development for Multics started on CTSS. For a year or two, they were using that as the development platform. Well, we we started on CTSS, but but uh, and. We, continu we continued that way for quite a long time, as I recall, uh, because Multics initially was, uh, when we first tried to run the system, it was a lame duck. Uh, we had, nobody had proceeded to time out what was going to happen when, and uh, we realized that we had a, uh, a monster on our hands, and as I recall, we we did a a very drastic slashing of our goals. Uh, things like uh, the hardware supported a possible 64-bit page size, uh, and uh, a 1024, and we we just scrapped the, and we had basically a change-making arrangement. Uh, we, we scrapped that uh, as ridiculous, over-designed by, by a lot. And things like that, we had to sort of cut out with a meat axe. Uh, but we basically uh, got the system up and running. Uh, And I, I forget exactly the chronology of, of, how, of how people. Yeah, as I recall, I came back in the spring of 68. And it had been booted by then, but it was slow because it was so complex, as you mentioned. But within the next six months, it was running and people were using it, but not for development yet. It was still CTSS, and we would make tapes on the CTSS machine and bring them over to boot on the 645 at that time. Um, yeah. did, did GE provide all the features you would ask for? Um, well, they were only thinking of hardware. And uh, right. yeah, that was there. Uh, Kalur delivered on the hardware, but he, he had no idea what the software was doing. He just had sort of grandiose visions. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was way too, uh, in some sense, he was way too compliant. Uh, uh, so there was a lot of naivete, uh, starting with Kalur. Uh, and uh, also with IBM, when they went racing off to try to counterpunch right. the. Uh, what were some of the features of Multics that were really unique and that you were really proud of and whatnot? Well, 
I think we had to, uh, I've lost track of the details at this point, but we had the notion of, of, uh, of access control where uh, not just anybody could reference a file or not all memory was equivalent. Basically, uh, you only had the right to that which you were authorized to get at. Right. So that that sort of idea, we kept the, the crucial ingredients, uh, but, but we uh, abandoned some of the, the fine structure of, of small pages and right. things like that. Right. I mean, the full joint papers mentioned dynamic linking, which now everyone accepts, hierarchical file systems, which now is in every system out there. Uh, these came out first in Unix. Virtual memory, which now everyone has, uh, although it wasn't first on Multix, it was possibly the first commercial system. I know Atlas had it back uh, years before, um, uh, but all the paging and segmentation were, uh, were brand new in Multix. It was, it was, there were many things that had to come together for that. Who, who were some of the key people that were developing it? That I know Bob Daly was there. Jerry Saltzer was a good influence. Um, it was only 60, 70 years ago. <laughs> yeah. um, well, Bob well you were among them. I, I was there, yeah. Bob Graham. Uh, he, Bob he did the dynamic linking. Um, I think he might have written the paper in the fall. Uh, there were so many new ideas that it was, uh, it was very impressive to me. I mean, we were creating computer science back then because uh, it hadn't yet been done, a lot of these things. And uh, you, you were leading that effort. I remember you would go down to Washington every year get another round of financing to keep it going another year. Can you tell me a little bit about all those efforts? Well, it was kind of scary. Uh, the, uh, a, few, a, few, a few key people, uh, Licklider eventually ended up down in Washington as the program manager who had uh, for DARPA? Of, of a, uh, well, I guess. Uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Yeah. Right. It was uh, actually, and Licklider, uh, he, who had seen time sharing on a PDP-4, uh, which is a very mo modest experiment done up at DBN, uh, was somehow, uh, he was re really very naive about uh, a larger system. And, uh, but the person who persuaded, one key person who played a pivotal role in, in maintaining uh, our, our viability was uh, Ed Fredkin. He was a close friend of, of uh, Licklider, and and uh, he had his ear. And uh, at one point, Licklider was about to shut down the project uh, as not re reaching its goals fast enough, or maybe never. And uh, Fredkin lobbied hard for us and uh, basically uh, saved the day. Uh, so Fredkin was a crazy, was uh, sometimes a very wild-eyed guy, guy, but he was, uh, he had remarkable uh, good head on his shoulder uh, when it came to doing things right. Another name that just came to my mind was Ted Glazer, who wor was working on it early on too. I think in the hardware design, was he working on that? 
Um, Ted Glazer was, he had been, he, he was a remarkable person to begin with. He was a, he had been blind since he was about six. And uh, he, uh, yet he had played a, a key role in the Burroughs 5000, I think. And uh, he came and joined the project uh, he, because he saw it as a, a, great, a great chance to make some, some uh, important steps, as I remember. Yeah. Uh, I remember he had a, a seeing eye dog, but the dog, he would lead the dog around. The dog didn't lead him around. He was, a, he was an amazing person. Another thing that occurred to me was one of the key things about Maltics was that it was the first large system written in a high-level language, PL1. And yeah, that was, a, that was a rather grandiose decision, <laughs> which uh, fortunately, uh, fortunately, Forget who did it, but we had to strip it down to its the core elements. So that it was basically a, a much more simple-minded language. The real, the real true PL one was uh, a uh, a nightmare of features. Well, eventually, Multics had the full PL one. Oh uh, yeah, and Bob, the, the first well, Bob one. Freiburg House is the one that put that through. Right, right. And uh, it was. Uh, amazing because uh, it was too grandiose a language to implement it in. I don't know. Well, one of the other things about the Multics project was it was actually three different organizations. There was GE, Bell Labs, and MIT. And uh, Bell Labs eventually pulled out, and a couple of the people, Dennis, and, uh, Dennis Ritchie and um, Vazotsky and a couple of others, uh, did Unix. Yes. Which yes. is a play on words for Maltics. Yes. Uh, well, Ken, um, Ken Thompson was, uh, was uh, I don't know that we can claim any credit for it. He was, he was a very, very savvy programmer to begin with. And uh, he, uh, he was, Basically, uh, so uh, Unix is a chance to uh, uh, simplify life immensely. So he did. Uh, right. The the one thing that Unix borrowed from well, borrowed a lot of stuff from uh, Multics, but it was also written in a high level language. So in C wasn't that high level, but it was a high level language no longer assembly. And that made it portable to a lot of platforms because high level language only needs a compiler. So they, they learned that from Multics as well. Um, w what other things can you think of that spun off of Multics that the whole industry took hold of? And I'm, I've mentioned a few, but you might have some others. I think one of the, uh, one of the notions we we had, which I think is spun off more, was we tried to insist that people describe what they were going to do before they did it, uh, which uh, forced you to become more honest about what you really plan to do. Because uh, in the early days of programming, people just started writing code and just seeing what came out. Uh, which I think the notions of access control. Uh, we originally had a, a multi-ring multi fantasy that people would, that there would be all kinds of layers of the operating system. I think we simplified that to uh, the inner core on the outside. Right, but then eventually that made it into the hardware in the next version of the 645 computer. 
by then it was um, GE had been bought by Honeywell. So Honeywell kind of took over the hardware line. Um, but it was still John Kalur down in Phoenix building the hardware and whatnot. And uh, I don't know if you recall, but he tried to design another generation beyond the 6180 and did not understand software, as you mentioned before, and his scheme was not going to work. But, um, so looking back on your, your long career, uh, obviously you did a lot of teaching, uh, professor at MIT. Um, what are some of the things that you remember most dearly about your career there? I mean, you met a lot of important people. And well, initially, I, I guess I... You might say more of my uh, teaching was in leading the group rather than in formal classroom teaching. Uh, I did, I had, I have done some recitation instruction, instructing, but uh, I didn't get it. I didn't get too deeply in the gro groove of that. My uh, my primary role was was leading a group of, of uh, research programmers, uh, right. which uh, and I, I would just, I would argue that was just done by the seat of the pants. I didn't have a great plan. Uh, I didn't go to leadership school. <laughs> right. Um, at one time, though, w were you head of the computer of the computer center? I was. Um, Bono kept trying to uh, avoid a split in the department. And so he uh, argued that there should be a, an, an, a, a, um, an associate head for computer science and a counterpart, a, uh, an associate head for electrical engineering. And uh, I was both reporting, both working with the department head. And so I was, uh, I did a couple of stints as associate head for computer science. Uh, once with uh, Paul Penfield and once with, uh, he went out to Oregon. I lost track of his name. Is there anything that you would like to uh, mention for the many people that are going to listen to this as a history of computer science as well as your life uh, that they should know 50, 100 years from now? What's, what's, what, what would be interesting? I mean, you've seen so much change in your life, as we talked about earlier. Um, well, one of the things that... I didn't, don't think we foresaw so well at the time, was, and it, yet it was totally predictable, was um, computers were, or, or the microprocessors were improving um, by a, basically a, a, fa a factor of two every two years or something. Uh, yeah, right. We used More to have some. But one of the things that inevitably happened was that eventually a CPU could be put on a chip. And that had, uh, once that happened, we had basically a, a profound change on the computing industry in the sense that uh, all kinds of gadgets began to develop, it's iPhones, uh, uh, and once you, you could have that much computing power within a, a, a very modest physical component, uh, you had a uh, you had the new possibilities developing all over the map. And uh, I, I don't know that people totally foresaw. The evolution of the uh, of, and, of 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 computing. Every, there used to be a 
what, a factor of two every two years, I think was kind of the rule of thumb uh, in, the, in almost everything. And obviously that had to stop somewhere uh, or somehow. And uh, we basically are, are seeing today uh, a proliferation of devices and uh, functions in specialized equipment, uh, which people didn't foresee at the time. Uh, how could you? Uh, I remember one time I was talking to Jerry Salser, and just to let people know, the, the Multics computers were, you know, the size of a dozen very large refrigerators. You know, there, there was, you needed a big air conditioned room, a big room to hold it all. And at one time Jerry Salter told me, this was probably in 1970, that you could get all of that computing power into uh, a, a briefcase. And I knew he was wrong. But boy, was he, was he correct. Now it's, it's on your phone. Because these phones we have are more powerful than those Multics computers were. It's, it is really amazing. Um, there's been an awful lot of change since, since we've been in the business. Uh, that, that's a, that's a, a, an impressive evolution. Yeah, the, the, the speed and size changes you refer to, commonly called Moore's Law, who predicted it uh, so many years ago, it's, it's only now slowing down. And they're talking about quantum computers, which are going to extend it even more. And it's just amazing. Uh, the fact that not many people could see the eventual place where these computers would go. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have trouble understanding exactly what a, what a quantum computer does. R right, well, <laughs> I'm not sure very many people in the world do, so <laughs> yeah, we're not alone there. Yeah, um, the, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not totally skeptical, but I'm, I'm, I'm totally... Uh, I'm mystified by the, the nomenclature uh, uh, that's to used to describe them and things like that. Well, being a physicist, um, the whole concept of quantum mechanics is hard to believe. The, the, the conclusions you can draw from it, so it's, it's amazing. Um, any last words you'd like to uh, impart to the history of the world? Well, I don't have anything profound to say. Except that uh, I, I think that uh, b b up to now, the uh, evolution of computing has been sort of a horizontal one into more and more specialized applications around specialized fields. Uh, I think I don't quite know where that ends. Um, the uh, Everything seems to be computerized. One thing that that uh, does sort of give one pause is uh, how how uh, how ubiquitous computing will be. Uh, Will it be in every device we touch? Well, certainly won't think of programming them so much as, as designing them to do something. There was some, some comedian who once said, the future lies ahead. <laughs> very good. Good words to end on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Corby. OK. Thank you. <laughs>